Okay, it is one minute after the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started. There's lots to discuss. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here today for uh, the Bill of Obligations, a Law Day program with Dr. Richard Haas. Um, my name is Dawn Smalls, and I am a partner at uh, the law firm of Jenner and Block and a co-chair of uh, the New York City Bar Association Task Force on Civic Education. And we are excited to co-sponsor this program along with the Committee on Education and the Law, the Task Force on the Independence of Lawyers and Judges, and uh, the Council on International Affairs. Um, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce my fellow partner and the president of the New York City Bar Association, uh, Susan Coleman, who is going uh, to do a welcome. Thank you so much, Dawn. Uh, happy Law Day, everyone. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here today. And a special note of thanks to our Rule of Law Task Force and our Civics Education Task Force. Um, Law Day, May 1, was established by President Eisenhower in 1958, quote, as a day of national dedication to the principles of government under law. Quote. It was codified into law in 1961, and as President Biden said in his very first Law Day proclamation, reverence for the law is, quote, essential to our democracy. Without it, equality and justice cannot be advanced, human rights cannot be protected, democratic norms and values cannot be secured, and disagreements cannot be peace peaceably resolved. At the time Law Day was established, the focus was on the competition between the world's democracies and those nations under communist control. Of course, today the challenges remain uh, even more complex with concerns and crises here at home and abroad, really all around the world. And each year, the president of the ABA establishes the theme of Law Day. And this year, the theme established uh, by ABA president and our fellow New Yorker, Deborah Annex Ross, is Cornerstones of Democracy, Civics, Civility, and Collaboration. And as President Biden has said on this law day, this year's theme underscores that each of us, each of us has a role to play in defending democracy and the guardrails that make it possible. The City Bar's Task Force on the Rule of Law and on Civics Education believed it particularly worthwhile to focus a program on this theme, and we are delighted to see so many of you here. As you will see and hear, Richard Haas's recent book, The, book of Obligation, the Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens, which hopefully you can see the link to in the chat, perfectly embodies all the components of this theme and challenges each of us to probe what it means to live in and sustain our democracy. So it is my great pleasure to introduce the host of today's Law Day conversation, Dean Jillian Lester. Jillian Lester joined Columbia Law School, my alma mater as Dean and Lucy G. Moses Professor of Law in 2015. Before that, she served on the faculty of UCLA Law School of Law and the University of California Berkeley Law School of Law, where she was the interim dean from 2012 to 2014. Her scholarship focuses on income equality, public finance policy, workplace law, and the design of social insurance laws and regulations. Happily for us, Dean Lester also finds the time to be a member of the City Bar's Task Force on Civic Education. So with that, I turn it over to Dean Lester. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much, Susan, for that uh, lovely introduction and also, and also Dawn for uh, giving us a, a very um, inspiring framing for uh, why we have Law Day and uh, some of the big themes that uh, make it so important for us to observe issues around the rule of law and our democracy. And I think that you're all in for a treat today uh, in uh, in discussing the um, our um, Dr. Haas's uh, book, uh, which I'm going to hold up just so that you can see the the uh, the cover uh, of it, uh, Dr. Richard Haas, uh, the Bill of Obligations, the Ten Habits of Good Citizenship. Um, 
Dr. Haas, you are the president of the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, a position you've held since 2003. You've served in four presidential administrations, both Democrat and Republican. Uh, you have held such critical roles uh, as special assistant to George H.W. Bush and senior staff of the National Security Council for which you won the Presidential Citizens Medal for your contributions to policy and development relating to Desert Storm. You served as principal advisor to Secretary of State Colin Powell and US envoy to Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland peace process. A tremendously distinguished career principally focused, I might point out, on foreign policy. So what about this distinguished path, focusing on foreign policy, has informed your turn in this book to matters domestic, to focus on the habits of the American citizenry? Well, uh, Dean Lester or Jillian, if I may, uh... I'll answer that in about 30 seconds. First, I wanna thank all of you for your commitment to this set of issues, citizenship, civics. Uh, you know, the law is uh, central to it. It's the foundation for it. I would say it's necessary though, but not sufficient, which in some ways brings us to the conversation of today. And I also wanna thank you and congratulate you for your open-mindedness. You're all lawyers. Today is law day, which I did not know. And here I am, I'm diversity. For once I am diversity, I am a non-lawyer in your, in your midst. So I wanna thank you for being so open-minded and to uh, invite me. You're hundred percent right. Uh, I don't take it as a criticism. I take it as an observation. I am a dyed in the wool foreign policy guy, been doing it for a long time. And I didn't expect to, to write this book, but if you, if you think of national security, which I often do as a two-sided coin, one side is the stuff we think of it, foreign policy, defense policy, what have you. But the other side are things domestic. Uh, without a domestic base, we don't have uh, the resources we're going to need if our economy uh, doesn't function, if our government doesn't do its role in the economy, we won't have the resources. If our democracy doesn't function, we're not gonna be able to set an example that anybody else in the world will wanna emulate if one of our goals is to promote freedom uh, and markets around the uh, uh, world. If we're not seen as reliable and consistent, our friends who put their security often in our, in our hands will think otherwise and either perhaps appease some stronger neighbor or decide they've got to become self-sufficient and say develop nuclear weapons uh, of their uh, own. If we're not seen as reliable and consistent, I doubt our foes would, would, would fear us. So deterrence by definition wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, work as well. And all, all the things that we take for granted in terms of uh, our society, if, we, if, if we're not functioning, our economy won't work. If we, uh, if we have political violence, workers won't be able to get to work. Uh, consumers won't be able to get to stores. You mentioned I was the US envoy to Northern Ireland. Well, Northern Ireland went through three decades of political violence. And one of the things that got me to write this book was my sense increasingly that that sort of decentralized political violence was all too imaginable uh, here. So for all these reasons, uh, I decided that it was no longer possible to think about America's role in the world without thinking about America's reality at home. And America's reality at home, I increasingly concluded, was going off the rails. Well, we're all familiar with the Bill of Rights. Uh, people well beyond lawyer, the lawyers in this session are familiar with the Bill of Rights. Uh, the title of your book is a play on that, the Bill of Obligations. So why this conscious pivot from rights to obligations? Yeah, that's my second coin. If uh, the first coin was the two-sided national security, the second coin is the two-sided coin of citizenship. One side are rights, the other side obligations. Obviously, and you don't need me to explain it, rights are central to the American political experience. We never would have had a ratified constitution without a bill of rights, that was the uh, requirement, the condition that several states said they would uh, need. You know, the whole context was obviously one of getting rid of tyranny. People were very uncomfortable with a strong executive, a strong national government. As dysfunctional as the Articles of Confederation were, many were still uncomfortable shifting to a political system with a strong 
national government and a strong uh, executive. So people wanted uh, the Bill of Rights built in, in part to protect the role of states, uh, in part to protect the uh, rights of, uh, of individuals. And American history can in some ways be viewed through a prism of narrowing the gap between the promise of the Declaration of Independence and the reality. Uh, you know, Lincoln's famous phrase, our unfinished work. And that's, that's a legitimate lens or prism through which to, to view American history. Uh, the founders didn't write about obligations. They wrote a little bit about virtue and character. And the reason is they assumed that. They didn't assume rights. So they talked about that. They did assume uh, obligations. Uh, and my view is that somewhere along the way that this was lost. Or to put it another way, if Lincoln's unfinished work were suddenly to be finished, and if there was no longer a gap between uh, our the reality and the principle when it came to American rights, we American democracy would still be in trouble. I mean, think about the issues on the on the docket to today. We've got a, a mother or a woman's right to choose versus the rights of the unborn. It's rights versus right. You had uh, on gun issues, Second Amendment rights versus rights of public safety during the pandemic consistently questions of rights of individuals not to wear masks or be vaccinated versus uh, the rights to public safety and health. It's interesting that uh, Justice Breyer said the toughest cases the court has to consider are not simple cases of rights versus wrong, but rights versus rights. And my, my own view of it, and you know, again, I would defer to people such as yourself who have thought about the legal side of this, is that we've just given short shrift to obligations, essentially obligations that the two of us have to one another. We're both members of this uh, society. What do we owe one another? Uh, either because it's the right thing uh, or out of self-interest. And second of all, what are both of us owed this country and this government of ours? What are our obligations to, if you will, formal authority? And so none of this is meant to give short shrift to rights. It's almost to rebalance citizenship and to remind people that this society will only function, this democracy will only live, say, oh, three years from now is the 250th anniversary of the Declaration, but we're only going to reach that point in recognizable shape and endure beyond it if we reintroduce a strong sense of obligations to our notions of citizenship. Well, let me just let me just for the listeners who haven't yet had a chance to pick up the book, it's a bit of a spoiler alert, but I'm gonna I'm gonna run very, very quickly through. Uh, through the 10 obligations and we're not going to have a chance to talk about all of them i'm going to zero in on a, on a few of them um uh, but but it's it's be informed get involved stay open to compromise remain civil reject violence value norms promote the common good respect government service support the teaching of civics and put country first so let me just focus in on some that I think are especially uh, impertinent to uh, the Law Day theme that we that uh, that we that's that's the reason for us coming together today. So several of your obligations involve better understanding people with differing views, and yet and yet in your book. You speak a lot about how divided our country is right now. Uh, the book is very, very much describes matters of the moment. For those of us who follow current events, it's it's very compelling uh, description of some of the challenges we face, including, I mean, and I'm quoting you, uh, Dr. Haas, that the center has been hollowed out, uh, as you put it, and that there's been a decline also, as you put it very vividly, in, in civility in public life. So, let me ask, how, how do we get from here to there? In other words, what is the strategy for even getting people in a room together when there is so much talking past one another or even vitriol in speaking across different points of view? Yeah, first of all, it's, it's always unfair to quote an author against the author. Uh, so I just <laughs> want to point that out. I know this, we're discussing civility, but you're, you're right up against the edge, Nadine. Uh, look, um, there's no magic wand here, but I would suggest a few things. One is with uh, students, uh, simulations, debates, and the rest is a, a great way to teach people how to argue, how to take on ideas without attacking people. I, 
I mean, as a parent, I used to tell my kids, wasn't always as uh, persuasive as I, I tried to be, uh, again, speaking louder or faster doesn't improve the quality of an argument, doesn't necessarily increase your chances of bringing the other person uh, around. So I think partially I, I like debates, like things that you all do, mock trials, model congresses. Uh, one of the ideas I had is have a model constitutional convention where students at whatever level, middle school, high schools, colleges, graduate schools, get a chance to debate these things out and even take opposing sides, switch at halftime. Uh, I think things like that are, are good. And then if you go on to other issues, you change the coalitions and what people learn is one of the reasons to be civil is that even if you disagree on an issue Monday, on Tuesday, you might find yourself uh, partnering with somebody. But if you destroyed the relationship on Monday, Tuesday's not going to work out, even if your interests tend to align. So there's a bit of uh, self-interest in acting civilly. So I think schools have a way to teach this. Uh, I think parents have a role to play here, both what they say and what they, they do. The example they, uh, they set, religious authorities. Uh, we're not quite as religious as we, or church going as we were as a country, but Americans still go uh, hear a lot of sermons every week homilies and the like. So I believe religious authorities have a special place to make the, make the case for civility. Uh, I'm not asking them to take sides in any of these policy disputes, but again, how we go about it. I also think politicians have a responsibility to model it. Uh, I didn't make everybody happy when I criticized uh, Donald Trump and, and then Speaker Pelosi uh, when uh, the way they interacted with each other. And when he finally did hand her a copy of uh, his State of the Union speech, she then rather dramatically uh, ripped it up. And my view is that even if he had behaved at times uncivilly, and he had, I didn't think essentially go, going low there was a, was a, a, good, uh, a, good, uh, a good example. So I think there's lots of things that people can do in their, in their, in their lives. And this is again where, uh, you know, we're not, American democracy is not going to be preserved by somewhat a single person at the top. It's going to take a lot of things happening, if you will, from the ground up. I think that's something that's striking for our audience. Uh, we, here we are in New York City. Um, a recent poll um, looked into volunteering state by state, just continuing on this theme. You talked about schools, religious organizations, and politicians, but um, what this poll showed was um, that, you know, measuring such things as helping others, formal volunteering, contributions to charity, the states that ranked highest were more rural and northern states, uh, red states, um, uh, as opposed to the coasts and the major cities. So, you know, what's going on there? And for us here in, you know, this major metropolis of New York, uh, do you think there's a lesson to build on there? Um, are we bowling alone too much? <laughs> As Professor Putnam would put it. Uh, yes, I think, you know, one of my obligations is to look out for the common good. Again, it's very much grounded in scripture. The idea that we're our brothers and our sisters keeper. And again, there's a normative element of this. It's the right thing to do. We want to. We should be treating others the way we would like to be treating. And through that, again, self-interest. During the pandemic, one of the reasons to get vaccinated or wear a mask was not simply to present, prevent, or reduce the chances that you would spread infection, but also that infection would be spread to you, or your colleagues at work, or your loved ones in your in your uh, family. So you know, I think those kinds of things are. Are at uh, work again. I think uh, here there's a role, you know, for religious authorities. Uh, I think for and for anyone in authority, there's a role there to uh, to make that clear. I'm going to return a little bit later to schools uh, with some very specific conversation about that. But uh, before I go there, I want to I want to pick up on the thread of the very beginning of our conversation about rights and obligations. Um, so. Um, we lawyers tend to gravitate to rights and regulations as solutions to many of the problems you identify. And we focus on, on voting rights. We focus on campaign finance laws. 
uh, internet content regulation, tax reform, anti-discrimination and social welfare laws. These are all things done through laws and regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, so should we lawyers stand down in our vocational pursuit of rights and mandates and legal constraints, um, take a deep breath and, uh, and focus our attentions in a different way? Uh, in a word, no. I'm not gonna question your life's work. I once spoke to a, the Modern Language or Teachers Association and I, I made an argument against spending classroom time to teach modern languages. And what I ended up getting were thousands of emails from people saying that I'd undermine their life's work. So I will not do that to you and your colleagues. I think what you're doing, again, uh, it is our unfinished work. So voting rights to take the, you know, one of the most basic democratic uh, forms of participation or involvement are central. Uh, I talk a lot about that in uh, the book. It's one of the areas, again, where our work is unfinished. Employers, for example, lots of companies have done this, but not all companies have made it much easier for employees to vote. Give people several hours off to work at a poll or, or go vote. Now, certain aspects of voting rights uh, are, are controlled by authorities. And there, the playing field isn't always level. So yeah, we need lawyers uh, to get involved where it's too restrictive. And there's a lot of other issues from gerrymandering the like. My, one of the reasons I wrote this book, though, is I didn't have confidence that a lot of those things could be, quote unquote, fixed or solved through the political process, simply because we were so divided. Or in some cases, the playing fields uh, weren't uh, level. So I was saying, I know where I ultimately want to get there. I just don't think we can get there in a single step now. So what I wanted to do was encourage more kinds of political participation or through civics make a certain case for how individual citizens uh, think about uh, government and so forth. So this is not an argument against uh, rights and using legal processes to promote them. It's simply an acknowledgement again that that's necessary but not sufficient. That doesn't help you with norms. It doesn't help you with all the things that cannot be codified or where there's different interpretations of the law and say where the courts are going in very different directions. I think we have a, a pretty powerful example in some ways of the limits of law right now in American uh, politics. And so what I'm basically saying, okay, I can't change all that even though at times I'd like to, maybe one day some of that could be changed through the political process uh, through getting different people elected and then different people appointed and the like, or we as voters are going to have to re reward certain behaviors and penalize uh, others, but we're not there yet. So what I'm thinking about is how do we act in the interim or how do we create a political context where we're more likely to bring about uh, a situation where some of the things you just mentioned would have a better chance of happening? Well, you know, just, just following on that, um, you know, I think you did talk earlier about civility and ideas for increasing the way we speak with one another and the civility with sure. which we do that. But just more generally, I mean, I think many of us will naturally think of the question of how, if you can't enforce them as rights, um, if you can't enforce as regulations or other kinds of um, mandates or prohibitions, uh, you know, how can we ensure that these that these obligations are, are widely um, observed, you know, and, and why not require some of them? Why not, you know, you know, government service or, you know, which is something that some other countries do or, or the release of tax returns by, by government officials? Why not, well, make, things, why not make some of these a well, law? Well, some things you might, you know, we look, I think the idea that members of Congress should not be able to traffic in securities trading, uh, in many cases, exploiting information they are privy to. That ought to be codified in law. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, in the me meantime, it ought to be, it's clearly a norm, often violated, and we as voters ought to penalize those to violate the norm. But my goal there would be to enshrine it uh, in law. Making public service mandatory, I think, would be a mistake politically. I don't think we'd get beyond the word mandatory. And we'd end up having this whole debate left and right about, about just that. So I would rather incentivize us. We have incentivize it. 
we have some interesting political uh, experiments. One is the all volunteer force with the military. That's working pretty well. And most military leaders do, would not welcome a draft. Uh, in California now, you, I could be wrong, but I think you have probably the larger scale effort of piloting various public service programs. And what's interesting about it is they're being incentivized. Uh, people doing it are being paid a decent wage. Uh, I think I would have argued rather than making student loans, rather than forgiving them unconditionally, I would have linked uh, it to a public service of some sort. Uh, I would think that colleges and universities could give preferential admissions to young people, say, who spent the gap year or two doing various kinds of public service, just like employers now advantage people who were veterans. They could do the same thing for people who uh, had public service uh, behind them. But I, I think it, we focus much more on the service uh, if, if it were not uh, required. And it would still accomplish, to me, the two, you know, it would be good for the people doing it. It would also bring people into contact who now never meet one another. This country is uh, so separated by geography, by educational attainment levels, religion, gender, color, you name it. Uh, I like any programs that bring people uh, that bring people together. I do think it would break down some of the barriers between citizens and government. So my view is let's not get into a big political fight about whether things ought to be mandated. Let's just make it attractive and provide the resources to it so lots of Americans can participate, whether at the federal level or the state level. Yeah, you know, there might also, I, I framed my question in terms of incentives, um, incentivizing behavior, and you responded by saying, you know, mandates, you know, there can be ways to sweeten things rather than mandating them. But, you know, there's also just, you know, as uh, speaking more philosophically, uh, there may be just some important normative or moral values associated with not making it a, a market, <laughs> not, I, I, not, not making it either a mandate or kind of commodifying it. Um, you know, I, I, I remember reading um, not too long ago uh, um, in my, in my pathway as in my habit, in my um, scholarship about, uh, about blood drives and paying for blood versus asking for do, uh, donations of blood. And, um, experiments uh, on trying those two methodologies have found that actually asking people just to give blood uh, leads to more blood um, being given than paying people for it. Um, I know there are different experiments in different kinds of, you know, small um, uh, payments for, for certain kinds of citizenly duties, but there's something about inculcating good habits, good uh, things that people do for free <laughs> um, as, as part of uh, as part of what we're trying to accomplish here, um, I, I think as well. Um, well I agree with you. I, probably, I should have mentioned one other. I think what you mentioned about tax reforms is an interesting case. Now, in most cases, I'm not familiar with certain states, but say yeah, it's 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 a norm that it, candidates should, uh, but we don't always insist on it. We don't insist on it in many cases legally. As voters or as the media, we should. I actually think there ought to be pressure on it. And again, voters or to penalize those who are unwilling to make their uh, returns uh, public. Ideally, it would be codified. I actually think it would be healthy uh, as a form of transparency that we knew about what uh, people who were standing for office, what they were making, what the sources of income from, what they were giving to charity or not giving, uh, what kind of deductions they were taking. I think that would be healthy. You know, the problem is you have to get those in power to agree to subject themselves to it. And their own conflict of interest may, shall we say, discourage them from, from doing it. But there's no reason that voters can't say, hey, this is something that's really important to us. And we're going to give money or give votes to individuals who sign on to this pledge. And we're going to penalize those who don't. So let me turn to um, your call to get informed. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems that we're bombarded with information every day. Um, I, you know, I just pick up my phone and there's news flashes pinging through even as we're doing this podcast. A Wall Street Journal is speaking to me. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, at a time of um, algorithmic targeting, you know, there's a, there's a worry that the news I receive, you know, I've got my New York Times, uh, I've got my New Yorker, you know, it's, it's just targeting directly the stuff that reinforces my existing beliefs. Um, so how do we get past this problem when we're trying 
to cultivate an informed public? Well, I actually think it's a really important question. I wrestle with it myself, but I think we're seeing it a bit with social media. We're, you know, the court had two days of oral arguments not too long ago. They're going to make a ruling about, and it seems to me, it, you know, on one level, it's the question of those who provide the pipes, if you will, for a lot of information, whether they ought to be in any way responsible for the content, the Section 230 issue. But then the one step remove issue is, okay, even if you say they're not responsible for the content, either for whatever set of reasons, and I don't, and I, I don't believe the courts will hold them responsible or the Congress, the question is once they start doing what you just described, which is emphasizing some information to certain consumers, whether that's qualitatively different, because then they're not providing simply neutral pipes. They are tilting those pipes or they're constricting them or, or whatever metaphor you want to use. And that's something I actually think we could hold them uh, more responsible uh, for. So what I'm hoping is either Congress or the courts do draw a, a distinction between simply a, a neutral carrier of content and a carrier that biases one way or another some content. But also I come back on one other thing there, which is I think there'll be limits to how much either courts or Congress will regulate uh, information. So I fall back on the consumer. And the issue is, can we create more informed consumers? I think it's interesting what our, our neighboring state here, that of New Jersey is doing. Governor Murphy signed into law a requirement that information literacy be taught in New Jersey schools. And the idea is not to teach high school students what to think, but rather to th teach them critical thinking. How is it they know that this thing that purports to be a fact actually is a fact, as opposed to an opinion or as a prediction? What's, what's good hygiene, if you will? The idea of multi-sourcing information or distinguishing between certain places that are edited and other places that aren't. So I think you know, there's probably limits to how much we can regulate our way out of this problem. And we may also have to improve the, the uh, if you will, how, how good we are as, as would-be consumers of it. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, as a, I'm, I'm in higher education, a dean of a law school. Um, something I think about a lot is, uh, is that, uh, that many Americans are very cynical um, increasingly cynical about expertise. I, I, mean, I think really we see it with uh, climate change, public health, inflation, other in issues that require, you know, an understanding of complex scientific, economic, and other issues. And, you know, the stakes are just so high. Um, you know, uh, you know, how do we, how do we re restore a trust in expertise um, at a moment when, you know, politically, uh it's a football i don't have an easy answer you know expertise has always been important it helped get us through the nuclear age things like arms control and deterrence didn't just happen it was because you know scientists and mathematicians and foreign policy types and military types came together and i spent the weekend because it was raining so much here listening to some podcasts and I was listening to a lot on AI and listening to Sam Altman, the uh, creator of OpenAI, and you know, talk about his and others' concerns for chat GPT and AI, that the technology was fast outpacing uh, regulation and thinking about various approaches to domestic and, and international uh, regulation. And it's hard because average, even higher, better than average citizens can't be expected to have the technical understanding, I sure don't, uh, about uh, a lot of these uh, things. So I think in any, you know, we are a representative democracy. We put our faith in government, either people who are elected or people who appointed. I don't really know much way about that, around that. Look, look at your business, the law. Uh, we give law, lawyers have special uh, powers, if you will, judges do, lawyers do. Uh, you self-regulate to some extent that you're all officers of the, uh, of the court, and we're all dependent upon your professionalism, your observance, not just of the law, but uh, of, of, of norms. I think it's one of the reasons that we're having some of the controversy around the Supreme Court, is that uh, we seem to have a Supreme Court that's not always willing to subject itself to, to norms and general traditions of, of recusal, and, and then what it is we do, or with doctors. 
We have boards of experts who certify doctors and review cases where performance was potentially uh, inadequate. So I think in a society like ours, we, we create structures, we, we create processes where we empower experts essentially to, to safeguard us. It's forms of licensing, if you will. Uh, none of us uh, can be expected to be an expert in all these things. What's so interesting about certain fields, not your own, is that certain fields we don't have licensing, uh, journalism being one of them. And I think one of the, and I'm not suggesting we do, don't get me wrong. So that's a perfect example of obligation. And what you had in the Dominion lawsuit was essentially a charge that these people who are quote unquote journalists, who have all this unique powers and influence that journalists have, were violating that trust. And recourse was found in the, in the legal system because Fox News would not self-regulate. Well, that's an interesting, that to me is an interesting example of how we, we deal with the conundrum that you, that you raised. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I think it's a really important problem. I, I described it as a political football. I really just meant that expertise can be politicized. Uh, as you, as you, no, but, yeah, you're, you're 100% uh, yeah. right. You know, Moynihan's, Pat, Daniel Patrick Moynihan's comment, everyone's entitled to his own set of uh, opinions, just not his own set of facts. And you, you can't have a political debate or conversation with multiple sets of facts. Uh, if, 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 there, if things are either true or they're not. Uh, you can't have alternative facts, to use that Orwellian uh, phrase that was put forward by one of Mr. Trump's principal uh, advisors. We're about to have a, an interesting test with the, the debt limit. You know, we do have a debt of $31 trillion. That can't be denied. That's the beginning of it. Now, right. after that, we can have all sorts of conversations about how much that matters, how we got there, what, what if anything, we ought to do about it. That's the stuff of politics. That's proper. But it seems to me there's got to be a starting position that we do. We have accumulated this debt on the order of thirty one trillion dollars. That's just a fact. Right. So it is just a fact. One more one more uh, uh, a substantive topic uh, that uh, is very dear to the hearts of of our committee, uh, our task force on civic education. We are seeking to enlist volunteer lawyers to help foster civic education in New York City public schools. Uh, and in your book, you seem um, cautious about, I mean, you are, you're for civic education very clearly, uh, but you, you express caution about going beyond the basics of sort of teaching the structure of government, uh, the role of the founders, sort of basic building blocks, uh, and shy away a bit from some topics, for example, Alter, um, all, uh, competing interpretations of histor historical events that might be um, lightning rods for uh, for disagreement. I, I guess I just want to ask: doesn't doesn't stepping back too much of uh, you know pre present the risk um, that you know you're avoiding some of the hardest stuff? You're avoiding having kids jump feet first in and uh, and and be challenged uh, by the most important debates. Yeah, I don't think we actually disagree because I don't think I quite said, at least I didn't think I said what you said I said, uh, okay. which is, first of all, I believe civics is essential. I believe one of the reasons we're in the fix we're in is you can graduate from almost any university or college in this country and not take a civics course. They're offered on most campuses. They're required on hardly any. And very few high schools uh, offer civics or offer ser a serious version of it. It's just not a priority. Uh, civics have gotten crowded out in many uh, uh, cases, which uh, it just seems to me you know, really, really dangerous for democracy. And again, I think it is one of the reasons uh, we are where we are. No, I, I don't believe in the, how a bill becomes a law approach to civics. That's too mechanical. That's one small dimension of it. Some of the things I write about in this book, attitudes and behaviors are central to, to civics. I think there's a character uh, dimension. I do think there's a history dimension, but I try to distinguish between historical events and historical interpretations. Events happen. Uh, we can, and uh, we know certain things happen, began, middle, end of certain things, and so forth. Certain documents can be read. Now, there may be more than one interpretation, and I think when it comes to interpreting history, there my goal is not to impose a single view of history so much as to expose people 
to it. And that might be the best approach. When I was in Northern Ireland, one of the things I failed at was to try to you know, get what was called a, a history of the Museum of the Troubles. And I wanted to expose the, this, this highly divided society. It's still divided along religious lines. I wanted uh, people to understand the, what had happened in modern Northern Ireland, the three decades of violence known as the Troubles. I want so they could be they they could all know here with the facts. Here's how many people were killed that day, and so forth and so on. Uh, here's what was going on politically. Here's what was going on economically. That that can't be debated. And then it showed them the different narratives, and then that would be basis to refer to, for talking about it, not to impose a narrative, but to expose. And I'd say the same thing here. The because uh, I think it's hopeless if we try to say there's only one interpretation of American history. We're not going to get out of the. We're not going to get out of whatever metaphor. You know, the horse ain't going to leave the barn there. So I think we have to say: here's the documents you need to be exposed to. Here's the facts you need to be exposed to. Here's the and so forth. Here's the historical events, and here's the serious interpretations. Doesn't mean you expose people to conspiracy theories. There's obviously uh, inclusion and exclusion decisions to be to be made. But I think there's a way of doing this. Uh, let me put it this way: I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to try coming up with it uh, in my uh, volunteer for masochism uh, pursuit. I will try to say this is what I think we ought to be teaching at the high school or college uh, level. And I expect it will be too much for some and not enough for another for others. But but I want to have something out there to help shape the conversation. Well, that's great because we're all working on this together and uh, our task force and you uh, both are committed to this. So we'll stay in the conversation. Um, let me let me turn now to some of the, we've had a few questions coming through uh, the uh, the chat. And so let me start uh, just walking through a few of them and um, I'm gonna read out the first. Uh, quips at the White House Correspondents' Dinner last weekend, according to NPR reports, focused primarily on attacks on Republicans and journalists, oh, uh, attacks on Republicans. And journalists speculate that Biden's ridicule of Trump at such a dinner before 2016 motivated Trump to run for president. Consistent with the First Amendment and respect for the Fourth Estate, what measures do you suggest for moderate rhetoric by journalists, even during their off time, to lower the temperature of the furor between identity groups? Well, yeah, there's the story that Barack Obama's uh, teasing of Donald Trump several years ago at the dinner motivated him. Always hard to do counterfactual histories. Uh, look, the other night wasn't meant to be balanced. Uh, you had a Democratic president and a comedian doing, you know, doing their best to be, uh, to be funny when they also weren't serious as they were about First Amendment issues and the physical safety uh, of journalists. Uh, I don't expect the White House Correspondents' Dinner. They, that's entertainment. Uh, that's you know that's all. That's not a place of journalism. That's a place you had a, you had a president and a comedian. You didn't have journalists uh, speaking. You had journalists essentially in the uh, in the room. But journalists, more broadly, again, have obligations. Uh, they're, they're I believe uh, both in what they cover and how they cover it. What's, what's clear is a lot of them are not prepared to, to meet those obligations. Then it's in part up to us as consumers uh, to, to turn them off if they don't. I also think it's a place for the business community. Uh, I talk in the book and elsewhere, uh, I've written for Barron's about how you know, the business community is being pressed to do all these things in the areas of DEI and ESG. Why not be pressed to do things in the area of, of preserving American democracy? Uh, I mentioned before about making it easier for employees to vote, but why are businesses sending checks to candidates or politicians who are who are election deniers? Why are candidates or why are our business leader CEOs uh, advertising on platforms that are giving voice to people who are either election deniers or violence proponents? So I think there's things that businesses can uh, and, and should do to to rein in some journalism, but again. Uh, we have a marketplace of journalism. I'm well aware of the, the First Amendment. Uh, so ultimately, it's up to us as uh, informed consumers to go to places uh, for uh, or not go to them. And like anything else, like politicians, uh, journalists, you know, journalists, uh, 
and the organizations they work, work for, they may not always be responsible, but they'll be responsive. And they have motives, be it to make a profit or to, to be heard. So they ultimately, the political marketplace will determine how well they do. So this next question is one that's uh, really about sort of the audience of the American people perhaps having changed over time since the since the founders. And uh, one of our uh, listeners asks, is it possible to discuss ideals and goals without mentioning religion and scripture in as much as many Americans increasingly are not Christian? We've changed in lots of ways. When we were founded, when we became a country, we were three million people. We're now what 333, 336 million people. So we've uh, we've come come a long way. The the demographic mix has changed in, in more ways than any of us uh, can can count. Look, the the only the only area where religion figures to me is in the First Amendment is that we have both freedom of religion. Anyone can practice as he or she uh, desires, and also freedom from religion. Uh, essentially, uh, where you know the anti-establishment. Uh, basis of, of, of the Constitution and the, and the, the, the Bill of Rights. But I would think, but again, Americans still go to church and synagogue and mosque and temples and what have you. So I believe religious authorities can have tremendous impact on lots of the things we're talking about today, civility, nonviolence, openness to compromise, looking out for one's fellow citizens. These are all things that are completely consistent with, with scripture with the norms and values of religion without necessarily promoting this or that uh, practice. So I think it's totally consistent with what we're talking about. Okay, another question. Uh, to promote the concept of obligation, why not a federal statute requiring casting of ballot, at least in each presidential election, as a condition to receiving a federal benefit, such as, for example, a guaranteed minimum income? Well, Australia, there's a version of that, that in order, Australia, if you don't show up at the polling station, you get fined. Uh, I, I'm, I'm told by my Australian friends, you don't have to vote, you can just put an X on your ballot, but you do have to show up at the polling station or face a, uh, a fine. Uh, I don't like, again, the idea of making it mandatory. It gets to something you said before about your blood drive. I, I, I like the idea of citizens being motivated uh, doing it not because they have to, but because they buy into this, this thing called democracy, of which I am a part of. This is my obligation uh, to it. I also think as a practical matter, again, there'd be tremendous pushback against um, making it uh, a legal requirement. It, it, let me just make a broader point. Virtually any structural reform you can think of, one or another party in power or one another group of individuals is going to feel disadvantaged by what you what you're proposing and shockingly enough it's good you're sitting down those who predict or project they would be disadvantaged by it will oppose it so the idea of mandatory voting uh i think there would be pushback against americans on a kind of libertarian basis but i also think there'd be tremendous pushback on a political basis because one or the other party would believe that in this state, in this district, uh, and the country as a whole, it would, it would hurt them based on their estimates of how those who aren't voting would vote. So it's just not going to happen. Uh, I think uh, I'm looking at the next question, and I think you just answered it. Um, I'll, I'll read it quickly, but I, I think we covered this. The Italian constitution, it says, provides that the right to vote is a civic duty. Do you consider voting as under one of the broad categories of the Bill of Obligations? Um, sure, I do. I mean, I talk about the second obligation after being informed is to be involved. Democracy isn't the spectator uh, sport. Uh, people should be involved. By the way, you know, we just had midterm elections and something like 55 percent of eligible voters didn't vote. And while some of them may have vote, not have voted because they couldn't get off from work or couldn't get child care, or what have you, I would think the, the lion's share of them, based on everything I've read, didn't vote because for whatever reason they couldn't be bothered to vote. What's so interesting is you look how close elections are in this country. A small amount, an extra 1% of Americans voting here or there could have tremendous impact. So the idea that one's vote doesn't matter couldn't be farther from the truth. Now, here we are in New York. Probably about, what, four or five districts in New York traditionally went uh, Democratic. This time in the House, they went Republican. And the basis of that, the, the House of Representatives as a whole went Republican rather than Democrat. My point is not 
that that's a good thing or a bad thing, just that it's a thing. And if there had been a, a, a slightly larger turnout on the on the Democratic side, you would have had not you would have had a different House of Representatives. So it turns out political participation uh, matters. And uh, again, we ought to we ought to make that clear to, to Americans that their vote is not irrelevant. It's not it's not wasted. And by the way, there is a difference often between what is being put forward by this or that candidate or this or that party. So voting voting matters a lot. A lot's at stake. Back to the theme of expertise. One of our uh, listeners, watchers, um, has some anxiety about people claiming legal expertise. Uh, it says anyone and ever, everyone is an expert on public media. <laughs> Ordinary journalists not licensed to practice law anywhere say, I am not a lawyer, but, and proceed to express legal opinions. What can stop them? Uh, absolutely nothing. There, that, that good old First Amendment, uh, right? And I'm probably guilty of it. I mean, uh, I didn't go to law school. I think I took one or I took two courses in international law. I remember at the State Department one day arguing with the legal advisor to the Secretary of State and getting a withering look. Uh, when I, I think I was asked about uh, my legal expertise and what I was bringing to bear in the argument. Uh, so. Look, people are going to not practice law, but uh, preach, preach legal opinions, uh, just like they'll preach medical opinions. Uh, and again, if, look, if it's informed, uh, lawyers don't have a monopoly on legal insight any more than doctors have a monopoly on, 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 on health uh, or I, I don't have a monopoly on smart foreign policy. And so I, I would basically say just because you don't have a PhD in international relations doesn't mean you shouldn't or you couldn't have informed, thoughtful views that are better than mine or this or that foreign policy issue. And by the way, last I checked, the experts get it wrong a lot. If I look at the track record of, a, of some major American foreign policy decisions, uh, that's something I know about. Uh, no one's batting a thousand here. Uh, you know, and, and so and I, you know, I won't go into your, your, your area of work. But the fact that you know, there's, there's decisions that are reached, uh, dissents by definition show how the experts disagree and, and decisions are sometimes reversed. So uh, a little bit of, I think we all need a bit of humility. Um, this one actually goes back to some of your, uh, your past experiences. The Sinn Féin uh, VP Sinn will attend the Sinn Féin. Uh, VP will attend the King's coronation. That would have been unimaginable when you were Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland peace envoy. The current Stormont impasse is formidable. Any reflections on how to resolve? Well, you're right. Northern Ireland's come a long way uh, from the the, the trots. We just marked and celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, which essentially ended the uh, uh, significant violence in Northern Ireland. Ironically, it's been hard to move a whole lot beyond that. What I've increasingly concluded is with su success in negotiations often makes it more difficult to realize additional success. You remove some of the urgency of what it is uh, you want. So at the moment, I think it'll be very hard to, to move much beyond where we are in Northern Ireland. Uh, there's not the urgency, the demographic changes uh, are, are significant. So in the last election in, in Northern Ireland, for the first time, Sinn Féin came out on top over the largest unionist party. So if unionists joined the local government at Stormont, they would be as the deputy first minister, not as first minister. This is not something they've ever had to uh, accept before. So it's not clear to me that local institutions will be up and running anytime soon. I hope I'm wrong. I think it's unhealthy, the idea that it's run out of London is shall we say uh, suboptimal, but I, I don't know at the moment what the politics of Northern Ireland uh, will uh, will allow. How do issues of increasing wealth disparity, vast opaque wealth, funding political issues and campaigns, and legal decisions like Citizens United fit into this discussion and solutions? Uh, well, it's unfortunate in some cases because what we have is a uh, public funding, public whether it's public or private is somewhat distortive. And a lot of it is increasingly unaccountable. On the other hand, the courts have ruled in ways which increasingly equate uh, giving money to politics as a form of uh, free speech. 
and you have all these cutouts with packs and super packs. So uh, all I can hope for is that things cancel out. I think it's unhealthy. Uh, and it's essentially, it's, an, uh, it's a minimally regulated space and what regulations that exist are off, often end runs are done uh, around them. So my guess is the best you can hope is that in the political marketplace, they largely cancel out. I don't see a way at the moment, given where the courts are, of uh, eliminating them. Okay, another question. Uh, please comment on how one would rationally, civilly argue with a passionate segregationist that white supremacy was unfair. Isn't it true that a significant fallacy exists in the absence of the obligation of acting in good faith, acting impartially and justly in the performance of government duties? In other words, the obligation of honesty and integrity. It came up in, in the course of the writing the book. And I guess I'll protect the privacy of the individual. But one of the people I showed the manuscript to asked me just that question and said, are there no limits? Like, are you expecting me to be civil in an environment where this was an African-American saying someone you know, was using the N-word and other stuff uh, against me? And, and I said, I, I thought that was a totally legitimate point. And if there was no good faith, that one goes into a situation being civil, but if the other party refuses to be civil, then there's no purpose in continuing the conversation. If you judge that's the case, you don't wanna have something trans become violent. So if it, if it becomes clear uh, at some point in the conversation that you've reached the dead end, that the other person's not open to facts or not open to basic civility, then I don't think there's any, there's no, I'm not saying to be unconditionally uh, engaged, uh, then you've got better things to do with your time and energy. Okay, one more question that uh, comes back to the, the set curriculum in civics. Uh, uh, one of our listeners wants you to elaborate on why you don't want a set curriculum on civics in high schools. Uh, um, what about, well, you know, go ahead. Well, the answer is like, I'd love for there to be a national curriculum on civics. The idea that we're trying to promote Americanness without a national curriculum. I realize that is, shall we say, uh, just the side of uh, odd. So ideally we would, but you know, as I do, that high school education is largely a state and local phenomenon. It's not a federal phenomenon. More than 90 cents out of every dollar comes from uh, states and, and localities. So you're not gonna succeed at having a, a one size fits all, even though it's crazy that kids in Arkansas would learn a different kind of civics than kids in Michigan. It, in some ways, it defeats the purpose. I get it. So I think the best thing you can do, though, is uh, propose something that various governors or mayors will uh, adopt. And I plan on, on, on working on that. And again, I think a lot can be fleshed out. The only thing I would say is I would not recommend only offering up one interpretation of certain types of controversial histories. I would say there you want to have all the basic facts and information and then expose people to bear to again serious competing uh, interpretations like we do that all the time in my business when you teach courses on foreign policy about the origins of the cold war you don't just say it was a hundred percent the fault say of the uh of the soviet union there's a whole revisionist school that you discuss or if you were discussing now the origins of the ukraine war there's various schools of thought about what, what you would say about Russia, what you might others might introduce about NATO enlargement or the, or the, the Bucharest summit or declaration or, or what have you. So I think you can talk about what's happened and put forward various serious schools of historical thought and expose people to that. I think that's what education has got to be about. I think we will get in trouble if we say this is the only set of uh, acceptable interpretations of, of this issue, even if something as basic as the Civil War, you are going to have, yes, I mean, there's a, the, the, the dominant school of thought attributes it to, to slavery and so forth, but there's all sorts of variations of that, as well as other things you could say uh, about it. And again, I, I don't see harm in, in exposing uh, students to, to, again, thoughtful alternative points of uh, view. And I think it's also just politically, it's the only way we have a chance of making progress in getting uh, these, these ideas uh, adopted. 
Well, I uh, I want to apologize to those who asked questions uh, we didn't have time to get to, um, but we got through most of them. And I want to really um, offer you our warm thanks, Richard Haas, for uh, spending time with us. And once again, it, uh, the book is The Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens. Um, I really enjoyed reading it this past weekend, and I really um, I commend it to all of you who've joined us today to to dive deeper in uh, this very, very compelling topic. Um, thank you so much. No, thank you all again. Um, what better day than Law Day to thank people who uh, devote their lives to the law, whether it's in classrooms or, or courtrooms. So thank you. Uh, thank you all. And thanks for, again, graciously having this non-lawyer in your midst. Wonderful. All right. Good afternoon, everybody.